Hey guys, this is John. Another update from the St. Louis Norm Congress. We're getting towards the end of the tournament. Today I had the white pieces against International Master Advait Patel. He's 15 years old. He has two Grandmaster Norms. His rating is in the high 2400s. A few months ago he won an absolutely stacked tournament in Dallas, finishing ahead of a bunch of GMs and IMs. So he's clearly on the come up. He's a strong player. And he needed two out of two. So two points in the remaining two rounds to make a Grandmaster Norm. So I knew he was going to come at me, even though he was playing black. Got to make stuff happen if you want to fight for those GM Norms. And I too was happy to play a full-blooded game because, you know, I'm on plus one. I can't make a Norm at this point, but every game I have against good quality opposition matters to me and my improvement. So I wanted to try to win as well. So I played D4, and he played the King's Indian Defense which is a good opening to play if you want to mix things up and play for a win. It's also his main opening, so I was expecting that. We played a Samish variation, and he sacrificed a pawn after thinking for quite a while in the opening. Kind of like my game against Tatev. I had a, a large time advantage out of the opening, but he played this move C4, which under the circumstances I think was a great decision. It might even be the best move in the position, but given that he had been playing fairly slow up to that point, um, he needs to win. Sacking a pawn there was a good idea, and I felt obligated to take it. I mean, if I don't take it, then the pawns on c4, b4 are going to be annoying. I constantly have to think about c3. So I grabbed this pawn, but after that, he's able to gain several tempi attacking my pieces. And the big problem for me strategically is that I have to give up my dark square bishop. And in the same issue, your dark square bishop, if you're white, is very important because you have so many pawns on light squares that your dark squares can be porous if you don't have that bishop. And I knew that was going to happen entering this line, but it felt like the principal thing to do. I am up a pawn. Pawns matter a lot. Uh, Yasser Sirawan would approve, being the pawn, the pawn grubber that he is. So I took the dive. But yeah, he ended up getting a lot of, of compensation. And I think I found some good defensive moves. There was a moment where I decided to sacrifice the exchange in order to try to wrest the initiative away from him. He was playing all these attacking moves, being very annoying, keeping the initiative going. And... One way you can try to combat that is to offer some material. So say, say to your opponent, hey, I'll let you cash out a little bit. I recognize that your attack is leading to something concrete here. So here's a little bit of material. Stop attacking me, and maybe I can start attacking you. So the pendulum can swing in the other direction. So that's what I tried to do with this move king h1. Uh, but I think rook a1 was a better decision at that moment, as Advite pointed out after the game. So after... King, A1, uh, King H1, he goes up the exchange, but the play got very sharp, and we were both getting in time pressure at this point. I unexpectedly was able to drum up play on the king side. I mean, I was hoping that that would be the case, but he played this move bishop f6, which I think was a pretty big mistake, allowing me to play knight g4 and then f5, and I start transferring some pieces over near his king, which is a bit shaky. He has his dark square bishop. It's a good defender of the king and the king's Indian but doesn't have too many other pieces around. So at that point, I thought all three results were possible, uh, most likely a decisive result, one way or the other. And the game continued to trend in my favor, at least I thought. So he ended up playing, in order to try to deal with my threats on the king's side, he ended up playing g5 and then f6 after we had traded bishop for knight. And I was very pleased to see that because I was able to plant this knight on g4. He has constant problems with his f6 pawn, and to some extent his d6 pawn as well. I'm also able to secure my king, which before in the game was looking pretty shaky, but I was able to play h3 and my king always has a nice square on h2. I was still down the exchange at that point, but I, hadn't, I had a pawn for it, and it seemed to me that his position was going to be quite difficult to handle. And again, time pressure was, was there for both of us. So we played a few more moves, I got this breakthrough move in, e5, which I was trying to line up for a couple moves. But I'm essentially under two minutes at that point. So I played this move e5, and I thought his position was going to crack. You've heard me say this in other games this tournament, uh, particularly the game against Tatev, but I really didn't think once he allowed e5 that he would survive, because either way he takes, I get to play one of my pawns up to the sixth rank with check, and it's devastating. But to Advite's credit, he kept... A cool head and he, able, he was able to find some good defensive moves. Um, after he moves his queen away after after e5, uh, probably I should have taken on f6 with check rather than planting the pawn in on e6. 
e6 just appealed to my strategic instincts. It's such a nice position to play, especially with little time on the clock, that I couldn't resist it, but I think e takes f6 was better and just open up his king. So after e6, we traded a pair of rooks, and I'm trying to attack his weaknesses, d6, f6, but his queen suddenly becomes extremely active. And with time dwindling for both sides, there were a couple of moments where he could have forced a perpetual. He could have played queen f4, back and forth. We did repeat several times, but he naturally wanted to play for a win. Only a win would have helped him on the GM norm track. So right at the very end of the game, he played unexpectedly this move rook e8. I thought for sure he was just going to take the perpetual. And I thought, okay, drawn game. It was a good fight from both sides, but a draw makes sense here. But he plays rook e8. And I had a feeling I had a win there. Just this gut instinct, like rook e8 didn't look right to me. I thought for sure if I had something, it was going to be at this moment. But I didn't figure it out in time pressure. Uh, I think there's two good winning continuations. One is very hard to spot. Even with a little bit more time, I'm not sure I would have seen that one. It's queen a7 check, king h8, and then knight takes f6. With the point being that even though my king's exposed, my queen on a7 does a beautiful job of controlling the long diagonal and allowing me to come back to g1. So if we take that line further, after knight takes f6, he can play, um, for instance, queen c1 check, king h2, queen back to f4 check, king h1, and if he checks me on the first rank, I can play queen g1 and block. Very subtle. The queen coming all the way from a7 to g1 and blocking. And after the trade of queens, I should win because I have this beautiful pass pawn on e6 that's protected, and also now a pass pawn on the f-file, too. And my knight's going to come back to e4, attacking d6. It's too much. It's stone-cold winning. So I'll forgive myself for not seeing that one. Uh, the other win was, so in the game I played queen c7 check. I actually didn't really think it mattered where I checked on the 7th rank. But I played queen c7 check, king h8. And not much time to figure it out. I decided to play queen f7 and attack his rook. That just results in a draw. At that point he has to take the perpetual, otherwise he'll lose. But I briefly looked at queen c3 instead of queen f7. And it turns out that that was the correct move. It's not as winning as queen a7 in that other line, but I think queen c3 should win. The idea being, so after queen c3, he can take my pawn on f5. He doesn't have any checks anymore, but he can take my pawn on f5. Now, I only looked at knight takes f6 in that position, and after rook e7, it seemed unclear to me, and I didn't want to risk it in time pressure. I thought things might turn around and he might get winning chances. But the thing I missed, which someone pointed out to me after the game, I can take on f6 with the queen check. So not knight takes lining up against his king, but instead queen takes. Counterintuitive. Going into a uh, point down endgame. Queen takes f6, knight takes f6. But the thing is, I'm attacking his rook on e8. He must play rook e7. And then I can pivot my knight back to e4, hitting the d6 pawn. And because I'm going to win d6, kind of like in that other line, I'm going to have two connected pawns that will both reach the 6th rank. My pawn's already on e6, but the other one will come up to d6. So I think that's winning. And just looking at it very briefly after the game, I, th I think that wins. Still could be a little tricky because his king can come over. But um, it's just one of those things with very little time on your clock. You have to weigh how much are you going to risk. I, I saw that a draw was the likely result of the game, and I was very surprised that he didn't just take the draw by perpetual on the move prior. And it's hard to adjust sometimes when uh, suddenly you might be the one with real winning chances. So I would have played queen c3 if I had seen that queen takes f6 subtlety, but as it turned out, I played queen f7, and he just repeated moves, and we drew. So I'm a little disappointed not to get the win at the end, but that was just a really fun game, guys. Like, I really enjoyed that, even though it ended in a draw, didn't help his chances. Well, it ended his GM norm chances, and rating-wise, we pretty much broke even. I think our FIDE ratings are virtually identical. But that was just like a fun game of chess, and I feel like I became a better player by playing that. So take a look at the game in the, the comments below if you haven't already. I always pin the game at the top. So I'm still on plus one as of this game. There's no round tonight. We've got a little bit of a break before the final round. I believe they do that to make, so, make sure that the tournament qualifies for a six-day norm. Because when you're getting your Grandmaster title, and I think even the IM title, you have to have at least one of your norms be from a, an event of six days or longer. So you can have a, a nine-round tournament in the span of five days, but FIDE sets this qualification to ensure that you have a longer schedule 
for at least one of your norms. So that's why it's this little break between the eighth and the ninth rounds. But in the last round, I'll play International Master Daniel Gurvich. I'll have the black pieces. I've already guaranteed at least an even score in this tournament, but I'd really like to put up a result tomorrow, win or a draw. So I'll be doing my best. And I'm going to go uh, catch up on some emails while I have a few hours here. Anyways, guys, thanks for following me this tournament. One more game left, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.